you know, yesterday we opened up vaccinations to those 60 and older, and on Monday we'll move to 50 plus. We've moved to these age bands after having all the most at risk Vermonters, the elderly, and those of any age with certain high risk health conditions able to be vaccinated. I want to remind folks this is going to move very quickly. Each Monday over the next four weeks, a new band will open, ending on April 19th when every Vermonter 16 and over will be eligible. And this is great news, but only if people sign up. So when it's your turn, make sure you do so. As we vaccinate more and more Vermonters and substantially complete those at highest risk, we'll also be able to methodically and safely relax certain restrictions. As we've done all along, these changes will be strategic and in close consultation with and in agreement from our health experts, Dr. Levine and Dr. Kelso. So in the next 10 days, we'll detail the path ahead and show you a blueprint of how we expect to ease restrictions based on the level of vaccinated Vermonters. This will demonstrate why we believe the 4th of July will mark a new phase, a time when things will look and feel much more normal. It's important to remember the focus of our vaccination strategy has been to save lives and limit hospitalizations. And we've made substantial progress protecting those at highest risk. Even after every adult has had the chance to be vaccinated, COVID is not going away. There will still be cases for quite some time but we can reduce the most harmful impacts of, with this vaccine. And you all play a role in that progress, which means we need to get you vaccinated just as soon as we can and when you're eligible. We also get there by continuing the personal responsibility of our monitors have shown throughout the pandemic. You also continue to play an important role in limiting the spread of the virus while we work to vaccinate more Vermonters. This means be smart about the things you're doing every day. Wear a mask, keep your distance, and stay home and get tested when you're not feeling well. If we stick together and stay united, we'll get to the end of the tunnel in the best possible position with the fewest lives lost. Next, we'll turn uh, to our weekly education update and we'll hear from Secretary French, but first, Members of my team and I had the opportunity to join a virtual youth forum yesterday with about 24 incredible young Vermonters who talked about the impacts the pandemic has had on them and their lives. This event was hosted by Vermont After School and I'm pleased uh, to have their executive director, Holly Morehouse, with us today to talk about some of what was shared. These were inspiring students from across the state with different backgrounds uh, stepping up to share their stories. The message I heard from many is something we've been talking about at these briefings. Our kids are struggling and we must pay attention and do all we can to support them. One student shared results of a survey that found over 70% of Vermont teens are reporting more anxiety and mental health concerns as a result of the pandemic while another said she actually did better learning remotely due to her personality. But the majority shared how important it is for their social and emotional well-being to be in school with their classmates, teachers, and staff, and that for some, school felt like the safest place to be. Several had this advice for adults. Don't forget about their mental, social, and emotional well-being. Listen to them, talk to them, help them grieve and heal the year they've lost. Don't sweep it under the rug. They also talked about the importance of after school and summer programs. And as you know, expanding these areas has been a priority for my administration. The forum is online at the Vermont After School website. I encourage you to take some time to watch it if you have a chance. It's so important to listen to our youth because they truly are the leaders of tomorrow. And if this group is any indication of what tomorrow will look like, there's hope. With that, I'll turn it over to Holly.
Thank you, Governor. I would sincerely like to thank uh, Governor Scott and his whole team for co-hosting that virtual youth summit uh, with us yesterday. I also want to say right up top, um, I fully recognize the irony of someone my age being here uh, representing Youth Voice. <laughs> that is not what I mean to do. Um, you know, no one knows better than a 14-year-old currently living in Vermont what it is like to be 14 years old living in Vermont today. Um, so I do, um, as the governor did, encourage you to, to watch the youth forum if you didn't get to catch it yesterday, to hear directly uh, from the young people. We do have a bit.ly link, bit.ly slash virtual youth summit 2021. I want to reach out and thank uh, the 24 youth, ages 11 to 19, uh, from across the state who gave their time and their effort uh, to make the summit happen and to be part of that event. Uh, they worked uh, hard on their pieces, uh, deep in thought. They gathered data. Uh, they arranged to get out of class or other obligations to be there. They made sure their technology would work. Um, all of those pieces together. And most of all, I'd like to thank them for sharing their voices with us. I won't presume to speak for them today. What I'd like to do is just reflect back on some of what I heard. I also appreciate the governor and his team for paying attention to the well-being of our young people as we work together as a state to move into recovery. A few weeks ago, we shared data at this press conference uh, from the Vermont Youth Project, where young people reported increased levels of anxiety, loneliness, and sleeplessness this year, a sense of feeling overwhelmed, and growing concern for their own mental health and for that of those around them. That data got our attention, but data isn't always enough. And the Governor's Virtual Youth Summit yesterday offered up another way, right, to get behind the numbers um, and to better understand the experiences, ideas, and needs of our young people. The summit was not about uh, the youth putting on a performance, right, or saying the right thing. Rather, it was about us as adults pausing, being quiet, and listening to their authentic input from a diverse group of young voices across our state. And what they shared was not cookie cutter. As the governor said, some ideas were specific. A crossing guard, more buses, especially in winter, help transitioning from eighth to ninth grade after this crazy school year, more racial and ethnic diversity among teachers and staff in their schools, sensitive and well thought out supports for reentry into full time school and life, and more education on racism. There was empathy and compassion in their words. They thanked their teachers, and many spoke to the challenges of maintaining their mental health. They're worried about making and keeping friends, domestic abuse, and being heard. They're asking to really be listened to and to have their input and experiences taken into account in an authentic way as we come through this crisis. Over and over again, they brought up wanting opportunities to connect, and they spoke about after school and summer activities of all types, from sports to yoga, drawing, crochet, swimming, biking, community service, and more. They asked for teen centers, flexible models for school, quiet social groups to read, paint, or draw, more mental health support, social gatherings, and someday, Dr. Levine, life again without masks. Reflecting on all the activities and interests the youth shared yesterday and recognizing that our wonderful Vermont summer will soon be upon us, I'd like to mention two open surveys to collect input and information from around the state. Senator Sanders has a survey right now for high school youth in particular to ask what they're looking for this summer whether it's career exploration opportunities, jobs, work, catching up on coursework, taking college courses, dance, drama, singing. Uh, youth can find that survey on Senator Sanders' homepage at www.sanders.senate.gov. There is also a survey that we have been working on with close partnership with the governor's office and a number of state partners to collect information from all the organizations and camps and schools and businesses that are seeking to open up opportunities this summer uh, for our youth of all ages, um, whether it's a, a summer program or um, a learning experience, a leadership experience, a work experience. Um, and you can find that sur survey at vermontafterschool.org slash summer survey. And we hope that everyone who's planning and thinking about um, offering programs in that space will respond there. So instead of closing with something profound or earth shattering, I'd actually like to close by stating something that I hope is obvious. Young people make a better Vermont. Just by being here, they enrich our communities. Young people are also problem solvers, and they are so eager to be engaged in making our state stronger, healthier, and happier place to live. 
And honestly, when I reflect back on what I heard yesterday, young people want and need what we all want and need. Community connection, opportunities to learn, a sense of belonging, the ability to get to places and to be with friends, access to recreation, and the chance to participate in all sorts of fun, enriching hobbies and activities. I look forward to seeing the results of the two summer surveys that I mentioned, and I look forward to working with our state partners and with youth to ensure that all young Vermonters have opportunities throughout this recovery period and beyond to be active, engaged, connected, and heard. Thanks for your time this morning, and I will now turn uh, the virtual mic over to Secretary Dan French of the Agency of Education, who is joining us by video. Uh, thank you, Holly. Uh, good morning. Uh, I will begin my report uh, with a review of this week's surveillance testing data in our schools. Uh, this week, we tested 1,408 school staff from all regions of the state. Uh, to date, this week's testing has identified three cases of COVID-19, uh, which is a 0.21% positivity rate. This is a slightly lower uh, than last week's positivity rate, and the statewide positivity rate is still low at 1.6%. We are considering ending the surveillance testing program for school staff as the vaccination program for them winds up. Uh, for now, <clears throat> excuse me, we intend to continue the testing for the next several weeks. The, the vaccination program for school staff is working very well. Uh, We're working closely with school districts and our various education partner organizations uh, to, to ensure staff are aware of openings at clinics being held across the state. Secretary Smith will provide more details on the program. The CDC recently announced a shift in its distancing recommendations for schools from six feet to three feet. Uh, we're excited by this announcement because it'll help support a return to more in-person instruction, which is critical to better meet the needs of our students. We are now in the process of reviewing the CDC recommendations and the studies that they cited behind it. Uh, this review is being conducted by Dr. Levine and the health department in conjunction with infectious disease experts at UVM. We are also working on revising the Safe and Healthy Schools guidance uh, to make it more responsive to the conditions of the remaining months of the school year. Last time we edited the document was in October in advance of the holiday period. We expect to pull together the distancing recommendations from the health department and other edits for review next week. At this point, we are on track to publish revised guidance in early April. In terms of our recovery work, school districts are actively involved in developing the recovery plans. Uh, we now also have a better sense of the federal dollars that will be available to support this work, so I thought I'd provide some detail on the funding. The federal dollars uh, to support the recovery work in K-12 uh, are coming to us through a program called ESSER, uh, which stands for the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. Uh, three different rounds of this funding have come from the federal government, uh, what we now call ESSER-1, ESSER-2, and ESSER-3. The programs are slightly different, but I thought I would highlight how much uh, the funding has increased with each new package. Vermont received $31 million under ESSER 1 last spring. ESSER 2, which came out in December, was for $127 million, or about four times as much as ESSER 1. And now with ESSER 3, Vermont will receive about $285 million, which is more than twice the amount of ESSER 2. So in total, that means we will receive about 443 million, almost half a billion dollars uh, to support COVID operations and student recovery in our pre-K through 12 schools. Although the ESSER programs are slightly different, they allow school districts to decide how to spend 90% of that money. And the Agency of Education can decide how to spend the remaining 10% on statewide activities. The 90% to school districts is allocated on a formula which takes into account the number of students and the poverty level of each district. To give you a sense of what this means in real dollars, I thought I would share the amounts for the three districts that will receive the most ESSER funding. Again, these allocations are based on population and poverty. The Southwest Vermont Supervisory Union in Beddington will receive about $26 million. Uh, Burlington School District will receive $22 million and Wyndham Northeast and the Bellows Falls area will receive about 20 million. A complete list of all the district funding can be found on the Agency of Education's website. Districts will have several years to use these funds, uh, but I think districts will have adequate funding to support the implementation of their recovery plans. A challenge we'll face now is how to use these funds in a strategic manner since they are one-time funds. 
as a former superintendent, I can tell you that one of the challenges with federal funding programs is that they eventually go away. Uh, so we do need to prepare for that eventuality now and try to use the funds strategically. To help districts focus on strategic priorities, we are emphasizing recovery activities in their grant applications. We are also calling attention to the improvement of school facilities. Improving school facilities is an allowable use of these funds, particularly when these improvements are related to addressing safety and health concerns. We think these one-time federal dollars uh, present an important opportunity to address the condition of our schools. In addition to the recovery planning effort, we're also working on guidance for the end of year school activities, such as graduation and also the summer activities, many of which Holly referred to. We will have something out on end of year of activities and graduations in April. In terms of summer programming, uh, we think it'll be important to offer all students access to some engaging programming this summer. In conjunction with the governor's office, uh, we are working with a variety of stakeholders, programs and service providers to design a statewide summer initiative that expands capacity for these programs and extends their availability for all families who wish to participate. Our hope is to provide a fun, engaging experience open to all students regardless of ability or economic circumstance. Currently, we are working out the details regarding funding, staffing, and resource allocation, and how best to integrate summer programs with what schools will offer as part of their recovery plans. I will have more information on this work in the coming weeks. But that concludes my report. I'll now turn it over to Secretary Smith. Thank you, Secretary French. Good morning, everyone. As many of you know, registration for Vermonters age 60 and older opened yesterday. As of this morning, 12,700 Vermonters have made their vaccination appointments. When you add that number to the 13,500 that have already been vaccinated through various other programs, and, uh, and for example, 1A, that comes to a total of 26,700. Uh, that, that's 55% of this age group that either has registered or already been vaccinated uh, for 60 and above. A technical issue early in the day caused some Vermonters to end up with COVID-19 testing appointments instead of vaccine appointments. Although the issue was resolved relatively quickly within 45 minutes, it impacted approximately 2,100 people. We have canceled the accidental testing appointments and the Department of Health has reached out to those that were affected to help them make the correct appointments. We do truly thank those that were impacted for their patients. In terms of our overall progress as of this morning, 188 189,500 people have been vaccinated against COVID-19. 85,700 have received their first dose of vaccine. 103,800 have received their first and last dose of uh, vaccine. I'd like to go to the, this slide here because I think it illustrates some of the things I've been talking about in, in progress that we've made in those higher age bands. 86% of uh, 75 and older have been vaccinated, as well as 87% of those 70 to 74 have been vaccinated, and 70% of those aged 65 to 69 have been vaccinated. If you wanna see how we're doing with the rest of the nation, Tori, if we can go to the next slide. Vermont is first in the nation for vaccinating 65 and over, according to data from the CDC. Um, and, uh, and quite a bit uh, in terms of ahead of uh, the rest of the nation in that regard. Turning to our educator clinics, in the last three weeks, over 77% of teachers and school staff have been vaccinated. You think about this, this is remarkable, and we thank all educators for their participation and dedication to getting our children back to school. As I mentioned earlier this week, we will receive additional doses of Johnson & Johnson, and we will ramp up vaccinations for educators again next week. Starting today, we are opening educator clinics to eligible healthcare workers and those in the 1A category. 
who will have access to Johnson & Johnson vaccine. If you have not done so already, I encourage all educators, eligible child care providers, and healthcare workers and others in 1A to make appointments at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine or by calling the Vaccine Call Center at 855-722-7878. Educator clinics will be phased out in early April as they will become eligible for all uh, community vaccination sites. That means that if you have not received a vaccine through an educator-specific clinic, you will be able to make an appointment at any other site by early April. Educator clinics will be available um, with available appointments over the next week include Berlin, Grand Isle, and Plainfield today, Wells River on tomorrow on March 27th, and Rutland and Hartford on March 29th. Later today, we'll add clinics in St. Albans, Richford, Montpelier, Newport, Brighton, Lowell, and Middlebury. Additionally, we are adding many other sites and collectively nearly 5,000 appointments will be added over the course of a week. As a reminder, registration will open up at 8.15 a.m. on Monday, March 29th for those 50 and over. You can make your appointment at one of our health uh, partner clinics, which includes Costco and Walmart through the state website, or you can make it through the, one of the community vaccination sites at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. If you are unable to sign up online, and we would encourage signing up online, but if you are unable to sign up online, you can call 855-722-7878. You can also make appointments directly with Kinney Drugs, CVS Pharmacy, or Walgreens. All of these options are available at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. If you're, again, if you're unable to sign up online, you can call 855-722-7878. But if you do that and you have multiple appointments, please cancel your appointment in the state system if you get a vaccine at one of the participating pharmacies. That way we have a slot for somebody that will need um, a, a vaccination. I wanna thank you. Um, it's been a very successful sort of vaccination program so far in the various elements that we have opened up. And I really appreciate what Vermonters have done in terms of stepping up and uh, and moving, particularly in those older age bands. We're number one in the nation. That's something to be a proud, proud of. I will now turn it over to Dr. Le Levine for a health update. Thank you. <clears throat> well, after daily case counts ranging from the 80s to the mid-100s, today we are going to be reporting 251 new cases. Our state's positivity rate is 1.8%. Our seven-day average positivity rate has varied between 1.2 and 1.8% range. This is a concerning number of new cases and should not be dismissed, but it is also not the entire picture. As Governor Scott has said, we've been successful in meeting our primary public health goal and responsibility during the pandemic, reducing the number of deaths and severe illness and protecting those among us who are most vulnerable. Currently, there are 26 Vermonters hospitalized, four in the ICU. These numbers have decreased significantly from highs over the past year. We never forget that these are people, not statistics, making these relatively low figures all the more meaningful. So why are we seeing this high number of cases now when we seem so close to the finish line? The answer is both simple and complex. Our efforts to vaccinate Vermonters is a race against what the virus does best move easily from person to person. 
Throughout the country, including up and down the eastern seaboard, case numbers are up. You've most likely heard on the national news the warnings from Drs. Walensky of the CDC, from Dr. Fauci and others, that the country has leveled off and increased slightly in its number of cases, and we must pay attention to that. With the change in seasons to warmer weather, people are starting to move around more and interacting with each other. As expected, we're also seeing both nationally and here in Vermont increased circulation of the more easily transmissible variants, especially the B117 United Kingdom variant. In this regard, the CDC guidance and, regula and uh, recommendations have really um, preached caution and a gradual and very deliberate pace of reopening, much like the Vermont approach. We've known for more than a century how viruses spread and have each had a crash course in learning how to prevent it. What we need now, perhaps more than in the past several months, is for everyone to do everything they can to keep the germs from spreading. This is especially important among younger Vermonters who will be the last age groups eligible for the virus. Let me tell you a little bit about the 250 cases. Half of these cases in the last two weeks, and a little more than half in these 250, have been under the age of 30. The largest age band has been age 20 to 29. Yesterday, a higher percentage of the cases were from Chittenden County, but cases are being seen across all of Vermont. The most important piece of information that I want you to take home, though, is to note carefully that only a handful, in fact, only four of the cases were age 65 or older. This, again, is a vivid illustration of the success of the vaccination strategy we're using. The good news you saw on the slides that Secretary Smith portrayed tells you what we're doing in terms of vaccination. The good news I'm giving you is the impact of that strategy on those who, by age alone, are in the most vulnerable group. We've obviously portrayed at other press conferences the fact that the pace of increase in deaths and the numbers of deaths absolutely have markedly decreased as well uh, during the month of March in comparison to any of the three preceding months. At the last press conference, I spoke about the spring-like weather's impact on our activities and gatherings. So with what I reported about case numbers, I will add a few words of caution about the upcoming spring holidays, beginning this weekend with Passover, followed by Easter, and then Ramadan soon after. If you celebrate any of these holidays, you're likely forward, looking forward to spending some time with family and friends, making up for having to miss out last year. So a reminder, fully vaccinated people can gather freely. That means two weeks after your final dose. But with recent case numbers putting an exclamation mark on this, please follow the current gathering guidance. Anyone who's not yet vaccinated should certainly limit their social interactions to one other unvaccinated household at a time. You may want to have the COVID talk, which you can learn more about on the Department of Health website, ahead of any gathering, just to make sure everyone is comfortable with the plans to stay safe. The CDC continues to urge people to avoid non-essential travel right now, but if you do travel and you are not vaccinated, be sure to quarantine for either 14 days or if you have no symptoms, after seven days with a negative test. As always, remember that testing is available around the state, and this is a key tool for preventing further spread of the virus. Again, to put our numbers of cases in context, more than 68,000 tests were performed in the past week, with nearly 19,000 tests just on Wednesday. Tremendous numbers not all explainable by surveillance testing in the college population, I might add, 
And I thank everyone who was tested and our lab teams for all of this work. You can get more information on testing at healthvermont.gov slash COVID-19. Additionally, we're making great gains, as you've seen, in the pace of vaccination nationally and in Vermont, which should give us all hope for the future. But as I and national public experts have said, we cannot give this virus any more chances to spread, not while declining cases are reversing course and the more transmissible variants are taking hold. Every day, more Vermonters are getting vaccinated, which increases our odds in the accelerating race against the virus. Now that we have a timeline for all Vermonters to get vaccinated, mark your calendar, make your appointment, and get your shot. I also discussed on Tuesday that the best vaccine to get is the one available to you. This still stands. However, we know there are certain public health reasons why one vaccine may be better for certain people than others. For example, the single dose Johnson & Johnson may be well suited for protecting people who are harder to reach or can't easily access a second dose, or may live in long-term care facilities as a new resident there, or experience homelessness. Because it will be a few weeks before we have sufficient ongoing supply of this vaccine coming in, this is not yet relevant. But as soon as we can, we will look to quickly accommodate the very few Vermonters who have a medical contraindication to getting one of the new mRNA vaccines, like a severe allergic reaction. We'll announce that uh, when the time comes. Our goal is to fully vaccinate all Vermonters as soon as we can. Your role in this is essential, and I ask that as soon as your age ban comes up, you register to get vaccinated. Go to healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine to register for vaccine or use the phone number that Secretary Smith noted as soon as you are eligible. This will put you, your loved ones, and in fact all of us in a much safer position by not allowing ongoing transmission of virus and more opportunities for the variant strains to flourish or further develop. Considerations like these will move Vermont to the finish line quicker so that we all can benefit. Thank you, Dr. Levine. We'll now open it up to questions. Let's start with Calvin. Thanks, Governor. So probably a question for Dr. Levine. So you mentioned we're seeing cases, uh, especially in young people, 20 to 29, uh, and then in the Burlington area too. So I'm wondering, is this because of um, behavior of young people? Is it because of the variants, uh, maybe a mix of the two? And I guess, are, are you expecting to see more cases at uh, college campuses and UVM as well? So it's one of those all of the above answers. Um, and because the cases are so recent, obviously we can't tell everyone's reason. Uh, certainly we are seeing cases in younger people who are generally more freely mobile, uh, do tend to uh, gather together more, and often have public facing jobs which may put them in more contact with the public at a time of more transmissibility of virus. I think it's hard to say that the variant strains play a major role or a minor role, but they clearly play a role here. Um, we can't begin to do enough whole genome sequencing to really get an assessment yet of how prevalent that strain is in the state or in certain counties of the state, but we know it's here, and because it's so much more transmissible, we know it will increase in terms of the percentage of total strains that we see. So that's playing a real role. The University of Vermont has had some ups and downs in its uh, look at the uh, numbers of cases that they've had, um, the last couple of days being a little worse than previously. But at the same time, um, the fact of the matter is a lot of what their students are showing with positive test results are reflective of what's going on in the region that surrounds them and where they live. So. Um, I wouldn't look at it as a specifically college-related phenomenon in total because that doesn't account for all of the cases. Also looking at the other colleges across the state, we're not seeing huge uh, surges in numbers of cases. Uh, it's been very, very modest. 
This was a bigger week in general, and I think Commissioner Pichak showed that on Tuesday. But at the same time, there has not been uh, a tremendous surge in cases across campuses. Um, and then, Governor, on a uh, separate note, as you've probably seen, um, House Democrats unveiled uh, their proposal to reform um, public sector employee pensions uh, and, and shore up the $3 billion uh, hole in the pension fund. Um, what, what do you make of their proposal, and what, what are your thoughts on using the $150 million uh, to kind of kickstart that uh, filling the hole? Yeah, well, first of all, um, I want to give credit where credit's due. Uh, Treasurer brought this up early in the year. I've talked about this a lot over the last four years, um, but it was going to take the majority in the House and the Senate and uh, legislators that, uh, of the majority party uh, to actually get something done. Um, it was alarming to see that uh, it's grown, the unfunded liability has grown from 4.3 to $5.7 billion at this point in time. Uh, so something had to be done. Uh, this was costing more and more to fund every single year and money that we didn't have. Um, so uh, great credit to the, uh, to the Speaker of the House in particular. Uh, I know it's not easy. I mean, you've seen uh, that I've had to make some decisions over the last four years that were uh, not in agreement with some of my base, some people that who supported me. Um, but um, but when you get into these positions, you have to do what you is right for the entire state. So from a financial standpoint, I'm in agreement uh, that something has to be done. I don't know all of the details, um, and I um, obviously am concerned about how we leverage money, a certain dollars. Uh, to uh, implement this plan, but um, but again, it's a step in the right direction. And this is going to have to be uh, something passed by the House over to the Senate, and then uh, we'll be all working together along the way. But uh, again, um, I you know I give credit uh, to the House Speaker and others uh, for moving forward with this. And uh, follow up: the unions um, are, are of course pushing back on the the proposal. Instead, saying that you know we should raise revenues on uh, the state's top earners. What do you make of, of their their suggestion and their proposal of how to shore up? Yeah, the that's that's an easy talking point. Uh, but uh, when you really actually look into the details and find out how many of these high wage earners we have, uh, we'll find out very quickly uh, that there's not many. And uh, to to raise that amount of money without doing anything about the structural issues within the within the pension uh, funds uh, and the retirement funds um, are significant. And so we just have to uh, take a look, uh, do the best we can, protect those uh, who are heavily invested. And uh, we'll, we'll come to some conclusion, hopefully. They've got to follow through. Uh, but these are uh, difficult times. Uh, again, when, you're, uh, when the majority party uh, is faced with this much uh, pushback from their base, um, I know all too well how difficult that is. So uh, we'll see how they do over the next couple of months. But uh, but I, I thank them for moving forward. Steve? I'm all set. Thank you. Stewart, NBC5. Sorry, Steve cut me off. Off guard there. I, I want to follow up on that on the pension issue, um, if we could. We're already hearing, Governor, about you know the uh, possibility of an exodus of state employees and police officers if the House reform plan goes through. What would you say to those in employees and and those nervous unions? Well, again, let's see what the final product is. I mean, this was the uh, initial draft that was uh, put forward. Uh, they put some effort into to coming up with a solution. Uh, I'm sure that everyone will have their opportunity to weigh in, and it uh, it may look different uh, from what it is today, uh, from what it is hopefully uh, when it passes both the House and the Senate, and it's something acceptable to me. So, again, uh, I encourage people to have their voices heard, uh, but also uh, to be realistic about what we can afford and what we can't. And uh, I think that this is something that's been brewing for quite some time. This isn't the first legislative uh, um, um, uh, body uh, that has had to 
come to grips with this. Um, this has been around for quite some time. And uh, the last time that there was anything significant done about this uh, issue, um, it didn't, didn't work. It didn't, didn't fix the problem. So again, we have to get back and uh, become realistic. $5.7 billion unfunded liability is not sustainable. It's not fair to them because in the end, someone is going to be shortchanged. I mean, if, if, if you come up with a, uh, if we keep going the way we're going without any changes, um, it goes bankrupt because there won't be enough money there to pay everyone. So we have to be realistic and we have to be uh, honest about uh, the challenges. Why, though, is it appropriate for current workers, future retirees, to shoulder most of, most of, the, of the burden? Well, again, I don't know the details, uh, Stuart. Um, this is something that the House has been working on. I, I don't know what it does and doesn't do for existing employees. Um, but this is a conversation that has to begin somewhere. And, uh, and I encourage them to have their voices heard. Now, again, um, I, would, I would say we have to look at the structural issues uh, within the plan uh, to be sure that uh, it's sustainable in the future. And to do that, someone has to give. And, uh, and I, from the proposal that I saw, uh, there was some one-time money uh, that was uh, going to be part of the solution. And uh, so it's not as though everyone isn't, uh, doesn't have to give something. But I would agree. I mean, those who have been with the, uh, with the, uh, the state uh, for uh, most of their careers uh, should not uh, be penalized at this point in time. But how far back we go uh, in terms of who has to carry some of that burden will remain to be seen. Okay. Um, and on a happier note, um, did you get your appointment or did you sign up for a test? Uh, yes, I'll be, uh, I'll be having uh, my vaccination a week from Monday. Pretty happy about that. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Um, you know, I'm looking forward to uh, more mobility, uh, more freedom, um, getting this behind us uh, so that we can enjoy everything that we have to offer in Vermont. So uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Thanks, Governor. Eric, the Times Argus. Yes, we've been hearing from some homebound Vermonters who are not patients of a home health agency they say that they're waiting long amounts of time just to get a call back to schedule a vaccine visit. Is there something that can be done to speed up that process? I'll ask Secretary Smith. Eric, I haven't heard that, but I will check into it. Obviously, we've been um, making sure that we put the allocation that's necessary each week into uh, EMS and home health. Uh, next week, it'll be 222 uh, that we'll be putting in. But let me check into that and find out um, if there is something that is going on. I, I just haven't heard that there has been an issue. We've been allocating home health uh, uh, from the beginning and uh, continue to allocate, allocate home health uh, uh, you know, uh, through the weeks ahead. So, I, you know, we've been using what we've been told is the, um, is the demand. So if there's an issue, I will check into it. Do you mind if I give you a call later, Eric? Sure. Thank you. Um, and uh, another logistical uh, issue, people who have a change in circumstance between their first and second shot, say they have to go into a hospital or they go into a nursing home before they get a second shot, they're reporting issues with getting that facility to give them the second shot. Is that something you're aware of and anything to address that? No, I haven't heard of it. And, you know, I, to be honest with you, I won't hear unless it's a multiple, unless it's a, a fairly significant issue that's coming up uh, in the registration system or in sort of the program. So, you know, these, if this is a huge issue, I will hear about it. I haven't heard about either of these issues, but let me uh, let me look into that as well. Okay, thank you. Okay. Cameron, 
Alright, St. Albans Messenger. Hi there. Um, I just have a couple of quick reader questions. So uh, we have a reader up here who um, has been vaccinated. Um, her husband is in the hospital with a condition, um, but is not being she's not being allowed to see him. Um, I'm wondering, is this along the state guidance or is this sort of a per hospital um, policy as far as visitations? Well, I believe it's a hospital decision, but Secretary Smith. Thank you. It's both. Uh, out of the Secretary's office, there are minimum guidelines that are established for visitation. We are revising those uh, visitation guidelines as we speak. I think they'll be implemented fairly shortly. What will, what will happen, those are the minimum uh, that a hospital has to follow. They can, on their own, uh, increase sort of the uh, level of, uh, of restrictions that they want to um, they want to impose but i will say this if you're vaccinated um, and you want to visit somebody in the hospital the new guidelines will say that you you can you can do that so um, i would just say stand by those are um, making it through the approval process right now they'll come out of the secretary's office uh, i would say in the next few days through the your through your agency through my agency, right. It'll, it'll come out of my office in the next few days. Okay. Um, my other question has to do with um, travel. So uh, if, so the, this reader cited in Massachusetts, if only the parents are vaccinated, it's counted as a vaccinated household uh, and travel is allowed. But if there's a family with children that cannot be vaccinated due to their age, um, but the parents and everybody in the household who is of age or older has been vaccinated. Um, do the same sort of rules apply to them or should they quarantine? I'll go to Secretary um, Curry currently for that. Hey there, sure. I'll take a stab. Dr. Levine might, might uh, be able to help as well if I don't get to it. Sure. If, if a family, um, if there are a couple of adults in the house and a couple of children and the adults have been vaccinated, but the children who are um, 16 or younger have not been because they have not been offered the vaccine, currently under Vermont rules, uh, you are not able to travel without a required quarantine. There's a variety of ways they can meet that quarantine either prior to coming into the state or um, once they, they do get into Vermont. Um, we do anticipate um, relaxing that policy as we get more people in, in our state vaccinated, but currently that is the expectation. And Dr. Levine, if, if I missed anything, feel free to jump in. Uh, Secretary Curley, Dr. Levine said you, uh, you answered the question correctly. That's a relief, thank you. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much. Wilson, the AP. Uh, hi. Uh, morning, everybody. Um, I'm looking at these new cases again, the 251. I just looked at the uh, chart on the health department's website, and that seems to be the biggest number we've ever had. Um, and obviously, Dr. Levine spoke about that extensively in his remarks a few minutes ago. But given, and I, I Given that number and those large numbers keep popping up, do you think it's wise for the state to keep uh, turning the spigot, no matter how? I know everybody in the state wants to see that spigot turned, but are we getting a little ahead of ourselves, given uh, the prevalence and the spread of the virus? That, frankly, I was kind of surprised by that number. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, admittedly, uh, the 251 caught uh, me by surprise as well. Uh, but in reflection, when you look at the um, what our strategy was and is. Um, we wanted to make sure that we prevented loss of life and to reduce the impact on our health system. That's been our, our focus since day one. So when you look at the, you know, you look at those numbers uh, and what's been happening ever since uh, January, December, January, uh, our uh, rate of death has reduced significantly, um, and that's great news for us. We want it to continue to move down 
uh, in the next uh, few weeks, and we expect it to. Um, as well, uh, the hospitalizations uh, were increased in January and February as a result. Um, so when we, um, when we look at the number, that's leveled out. In fact, it's still declining. Uh, we received more good news this morning, uh, fewer in ICU, a few more, uh, a few uh, fewer uh, in uh, COVID-related hospitalizations, and there were zero vented as of today. So those are the metrics uh, that we chose to look at. And again, as Dr. Levine extensively talked about in his remarks, um, when you look at the, the age groups, it's a lower age. So the vaccines are working. I mean, that's, uh, that's great news. Um, so again, it's concerning. It's something that we all have the ability uh, to prevent in some uh, capacity. Um, we can't let our guard down. We need to continue to wear our masks, uh, stay physically distanced, avoid crowds, wash your hands. All the things that we've done over the last 13, 14 months are going to be important over the next couple of months as well. So we'll, uh, we'll continue to watch the numbers. We'll continue to watch. Our focus continues to be on hospitalizations and deaths. And uh, if we see uh, that there's a change there, we will react uh, with, uh, in accordance with our healthcare professionals, Dr. Levine, Dr. Kelso, uh, we'll make changes as necessary. But at this point in time, uh, we don't see that there's a need to change course. I'll let Dr. Um, Levine answer. Okay, great. Yeah, I'll let Dr. Okay. Levine add to that. Okay, thank you pretty challenging to, to add too much to that. But the reality is um, we should always continue to be humbled by the virus. Uh, the reality is countries like France and Italy are locking down again. Um, the world is not safe right now with regard to the virus. Uh, it's shown its ability to keep resurging. And that's just the reality we face. Um, and. We know that pandemic fatigue has played a role all across the world and certainly across our country. So we have to be cognizant. But if you think about the cases that we have now, one thing that is not tying them together is uh, large gatherings or even medium gatherings. Um, and you know there, there haven't been abundant spigot changes, uh, but a couple of them have dealt with gatherings. But what we're seeing in our cases isn't really reflective of people um, abusing the privileges, if you will, of gatherings. Um, we're, show, we're finding cases in our work sites, but not the whole work site, usually a person. We're finding cases in our colleges and schools. We're finding cases in some of our healthcare settings where someone shows up at an infectious time, but not symptomatic, and they're a case. Um, so that's been the trend for quite a while now. We do find that if you're a contact, the most likely way you became a case, if you did, and about 15 or so percent of people are becoming cases, uh, is through the people you live with. So a household contact uh, as opposed to anything else. And even in our uh, school data, most of the time if we have a contact that turns positive, it wasn't a contact who was sitting at the next desk in the school, it was someone in the home setting. So that's how this has really been playing out. And I agree, Wilson, we have to be very vigilant and look at this data very carefully. But believe me, we do that every day, uh, multiple times a day. So uh, that's how things are going to proceed uh, on. And again- Okay, great, another- Can, can I just one- okay. One more, just finer point on that. Uh, again, when you look at the sheer number of tests uh, that were done as a result of the 251 cases that were found, um, 19,000. I mean, think back, I think Secretary Smith uh, talked about this on our 206 uh, State Emergency Operations uh, Center call uh, this morning. And he said, you know, a year ago, uh, we thought, 100 or 200 tests was a lot, and we we're struggling to do so. And now to think 19,000. So we don't know out of the 251, 
uh, the severity of, of cases. I don't think we've looked into that uh, yet, and we don't even know how to measure it, but I would venture to say uh, there could be a number of those that are asymptomatic, but they don't really have any conditions. They just happen to have are carrying the virus. So um, before we, again, that's why we watch that hospitalization rate. And when you look back over the last month or so, or you know, with the hospitalizations, and it stayed re relatively flat and is, and is in fact uh, dipping downward a bit, that gives us hope because we've been opening the spigot a little bit more in the last month or two, and uh, we haven't seen the hospitalizations increase uh, as a result of. So that's what we watch. That's the metric we watch. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. Another health question, not directly about COVID, but uh, I saw the health department's report, I don't know exactly when it came out, but about the opioid death, that they were up 38%. Um, I don't, I know that issue has uh, come up elsewhere. I don't know what the exact percentage, but I wonder if you have any thoughts on, any of you have any thoughts on what's driving this? Dr. Levine. Yes, I've, uh, I've actually had the chance at this very press conference to comment on that previously. Um, just to put it into perspective, <clears throat> the re they're trying to reduce the rate of opioid overdoses that are unintentional causing death uh, has been a priority for a long time. For about five consecutive years, no matter what was done, that rate continued to stay stable or go up a little. A year ago, we had a marked decrease in the death rate, and it looked like strategies were beginning to work. We had hoped that that would be the beginning of a trend, but obviously the pandemic came. So the explanations for why this reversal has occurred include a whole host of factors. One is the stress of a pandemic and what that impacts, how that impacts a person who has an opioid use disorder or who is susceptible to developing an opioid use disorder. Second factor is that the best way a person can avoid an opioid overdose death, if they're going to continue to use intravenous drugs, is to use those with friends and to have somebody available to them to, if you will, rescue them with Narcan, with a 911 call, whatever is required if they are not arousable after uh, their injection. That went away with a stay home, stay safe, and the ability of people to really stay separate from one another. Uh, that safety net was reduced significantly for this population. There's plenty of Narcan available, and we have, as I've said in the past, flooded the streets with Narcan uh, across Vermont, it's a very low threshold to provide uh, a person or a friend of a person or a family member with Narcan to use uh, to save someone's life. But if you're injecting alone, you're not going to be able to administer the Narcan by yourself and you can have a bad outcome. There's also the increase in prevalence of fentanyl and now 88% of all of our overdose deaths have in some, can, some way a connection with fentanyl. Even when the person thought they were using cocaine, a stimulant, not a depressant medication, uh, there was fentanyl mixed in with the cocaine. So um, that's just part of the marketplace and the way things have evolved. Lastly, there's also, I believe, um, an opportunity for people to, well, there was a necessity for people to use alternate procurement routes for their drugs because their usual suppliers in the uh, advent of a pandemic weren't always there as the go-to people. So they were going to people that they didn't know, they were getting powders that they had no idea what was really in them, and they were more susceptible to having an overdose because it was a different drug supply. So there's a whole host of reasons um, that were sort of uh, associated with what's happening. The reasons that aren't associated are, number one, the medication-assisted treatment access, hubs and spokes in Vermont, has remained as robust as ever and, in fact, had increasing enrollment. 
uh, and maintained uh, lots of opportunity for people to be able to attend and get what they needed as a uh, form of medication for opioid use disorder. Uh, number two, the initiatives like providing rapid access to buprenorphine in emergency room settings, in hospital settings, and in syringe service programs um, has only increased and will continue to increase uh, over time. Uh, so the treatment system itself became more user-friendly. Even Vermonters who had an opioid disorder and were in a spoke setting uh, could get a prescription without a face-to-face -face visit because, as you know, so much more has been done by telehealth and telemedicine. So a lot has been put into play, um, but the power of the, of the pandemic uh, was quite overwhelming for this population, unfortunately. Okay, thank you very much. Aaron VT Digger. Hi. When the bar restrictions were loosened, the state gave uh, local municipalities the option to put additional restrictions of their own onto that reopening or prevent it altogether. Um, and as far as I can tell, no municipality has taken up, you up on that offer yet. Um, with so many reports of, um, you know, increases among college students in particular, and today was a new record breaker for Chittenden County, um, would you encourage municipalities like Burlington that are seeing such heavy spread to consider um, shutting bars down again? Um, I didn't hear the first part. I heard the last part of the question, Aaron, but... Um, but let me answer that part of the question, unless there wasn't a question in the beginning. Um, but the, um, in terms of we put the, we gave the ability to municipal, municipalities and uh, local governing boards to make the decision whether they should open or, or close uh, or keep closed the um, bars and, uh, and social clubs. Um, so that uh, will remain in place and they'll do what they think is right. Uh, at this point in time, uh, Dr. Levine, I'm sure, will we'll put a finer point on it. You know, we don't know where this is coming from. I don't believe um, there's been enough time uh, for this to be uh, an issue that was caused by the bars or social clubs. Um, but we'll have to continue to monitor that with our contact tracing. Dr. Levine, anything? Well, that's correct, Governor, and, and the bars are under tremendous restriction as they are right now uh, following the restaurant guidance. Uh, so unless they weren't following guidance, there was no opportunity for, I think, the kind of transmission of virus in that setting that people fear. And I have complete confidence that they have been following that guidance. Um, this would be too early for me to say where the most recent cases came from uh, and if that was involved. but. Uh, I wouldn't want to give you any reason to believe that that is a uh, common pathway by any means. And, uh, and the mayors, as the governor pointed out, do have um, the opportunity to be more restrictive um, should we get less restrictive even in the future with regard to operations of bars. I think Secretary Curley also wanted to just offer mm -hmm. something. Yes, uh, thank you, Rebecca. As Dr. Levine and the governor both have pointed out about the restrictions that we put in place, and I think it's really important for um, people to understand when they're operating bars or when they're thinking about bars and social clubs operating, we specifically worked hard um, to find a path forward for them and agreed that, that having them follow the restaurant guidance would be probably everyone's best chance at being successful. The restaurant industry has shown us um, by following our guidance, they've been very successful in mitigating any spread of COVID um, or, or the spread of COVID within the restaurant, the restaurant environment. So just as a reminder, um, patrons must be seated while they're at the bar or, um, or at a bar. Um, there's less call at 10 p.m. Uh, bars are, are required to keep a list of their who has visited their, their bar in the last 30 days. 
the, all of the guidance is on our website at ACCD under, again, under the restaurant guidance. And I think it's uh, really helpful if people refresh uh, their memory or their, their understanding of what those expectations are. So um, again, we're feeling like we gave them a, a path guidance that will help them be successful. And again, um, and, and help the communities not have further spread as a result of them being open. What do you have to say to the multiple servers who have told me that it is extremely difficult to enforce COVID restrictions at their restaurant, especially um, mask holes for either people picking up takeout or for people who are visiting the restaurant but are expected to leave the mask on, you know, when they're not eating? Um, you know, this seems to be something that is not restricted to one restaurant, but all across the state, where we're just saying it's very difficult for them to be the ones to enforce COVID restrictions. Yeah, I, I, from my standpoint, and I'll let Secretary Curley weigh in as well, but uh, this has been a problem since day one, right? Um, this isn't something that's evolving today. Um, we are advocating for people to continue to wear their masks uh, where appropriate, uh, making sure they keep their distance, follow the guidelines, follow the restrictions, and uh, and just be sensitive uh, to who they're coming in contact with as well. Um, we're trying to slowly open up the economy uh, in a very safe and strategic way and making sure the mitigation measures stay in place just as long as we possibly can and get people vaccinated. So. Uh, it's incumbent upon all of us individually uh, to do the right thing for the right reasons and to be, um, be aware of who, again, you're coming in contact with and try and keep them safe as well and, and yourself and your family members. So um, this, um, this isn't anything new. Uh, we've heard this from the start uh, and we've, in fact, uh, we've seen in recent, uh, recent weeks where some businesses have not uh, tried to conform at all and uh, in fact have taken another approach. So uh, this is very, still very much a pandemic and we need to make sure that people are continuing to wear their masks. Secretary Curley. Yeah, Governor, I, I think you, you know, really nailed it. I, I, I think our reminder is um, that, you know, we're all doing our part and we are grateful for the restaurant owners and, and every sector really that are enforcing this. And we know it's not easy and we appreciate the work that people are doing to try to um, ask their customers to comply. And as a reminder, businesses um, ha are entirely in the right if they refuse service, if they want to refuse service for somebody who is unwilling to um, comply with the mandate, which is exactly what it is. Um, and I am in touch with restaurant owners pretty regularly and they have expressed their frustration, but at the same time, I would say that um, they are also grateful for the uh, safety guidelines that are in place because they are very concerned about their employees and the people that they serve. Um, when you go to a restaurant, it's an experience, and, and everybody wants them to walk away remembering a positive experience. So um, it's hard. We're getting closer, but um, everybody just has to... to Stay dialed in for a little bit longer, and it's hard work. Um, but we're gonna we're gonna get through this, and and I would say to the the staff as well, it's it's worth the effort to enforce. Okay, thank you. Um, I also have a question about school data. Um, the state has reported 96 school cases in the past seven days. I don't know for certain that's a record, but it's definitely higher than it was a couple weeks ago. And there appears to be a bit of a uh, particular spread in Colchester High School. Uh, what is the state doing to kind of check in on this or combat that specific outbreak? And also, do we know why there are cases spreading among students in particular? Well, again, first of all, I, I think we're jumping to the conclusion that this spread within the school, and I'm not sure that's the case in every uh, uh, situation. I think it's actually coming from the outside in. So it's about the community, their families, and and they're bringing it into the school. Uh, and so that's why contact tracing is so important uh, to be sure that we minimize that, to mitigate that so that there isn't spread, there isn't outbreaks within the school themselves. But I might let uh, Dan, yeah, Secretary French uh, answer further and, and possibly Dr. Levine, if he has anything else to add. 
Yeah, thank you, Governor. No, I would just, uh, you know, echo what you said. I think, you know, the, as we've known, uh, what we see happening in schools is, is often a reflection of what the activity is in the communities. Uh, as Dr. Levine mentioned earlier, we, we are seeing a large number of cases in the Chittenden County area. Uh, so should we shouldn't be surprised to a certain extent to see uh, the schools in that area seeing increased cases, but it is concerning. Um, and I know the health department's working very closely with the schools uh, to support them, but I, I don't think there's broader patterns of outbreak per se. But perhaps, Dr. Levine, you want to add to that? Yeah, we work very closely with the schools and the uh, school administrations when these occur, uh, but at the same time, uh, the schools are very quick to be on top of these as quickly as possible so that they can understand if there's any staffing concerns that might arise or if there are concerns about uh, transmission within a certain setting. Um, but Secretary French really uh, summarized it well that where we see more viral activity in a community, we expect to see it in all of the various parts of that community and schools unfortunately are not totally protected. I, can't, I don't have um, specific insight into Colchester to give you. I know you asked that in your question, but I, uh, we have a lot of schools in the state. And I don't have specific insight into that. Okay, thank you. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. Hi, Governor. Uh, the unemployment rate came out <clears throat> today 3.1 percent, which is which is very low, but you've mentioned in the past that it paints a rosier picture than the than really is being reflected. But one thing that Commissioner Harrington mentioned in the report is that professional technical services are at about a historical high in employment, and of course they've been able to work remotely. Uh, the House is proposing a $150 million broadband bill uh, that presumably would, would encourage uh, remote working and, and working on these type of uh, uh, jobs is 150 million enough to get the to get broadband to the last mile, or or is more needed, and where might that come from? Yeah, I I don't believe it's enough, uh, Tim. As a matter of fact, uh, we'll be presenting our plan to the legislature. It gives me an opportunity to talk about this a little bit. I I think it's incumbent upon us, uh, as with the with the leaders of the House and the Senate, and myself, uh, to get together uh, to have uh, some sort of idea of what we're going to do what what is our plan what, what's the uh, what's our outlook on on what we want to do with this incredible gift uh, that we're receiving about a billion dollars uh, and we have to make sure uh, that we're using utilizing it in the right fashion uh, and when I say that uh, we have some incredible legacy uh, monumental needs in this state uh, that we have uh, seen for decades and have experienced and talked about uh, that we need to to focus on. So, uh, I, but I think we have to 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 get you know the concept first, um, what it is uh, that we can all agree to, and uh, and choose wisely um, because again this is a one-time gift. It doesn't keep coming, uh, and so it's important for us uh, to solve some of these legacy issues. Uh, and do it in a way that truly does solve it. So from my standpoint, I think that there's about a $300 million need uh, for broadband. And uh, so I will advocate, we'll put a plan together and work with the legislature on this, but that's one area. And the other area, uh, you know, I would say uh, that we all uh, would agree uh, is, a, is problematic for the state is housing. Uh, and that's for low income and uh, those for the workforce, uh, you know, decent, affordable housing uh, for the workforce. So I, um, I look forward to this again in the next uh, week to 10 days. We'll be presenting our plan to the legislature so that we, again, use this strategically uh, to get the best return on investment. Uh, and we solve some of the, these historic problems that we face each and every day to make a stronger foundation for the future. Uh, great, thank you. Lisa, the Valley Reporter. Hello, we heard from a Wakefield woman who was affected by the vaccine scheduling issue yesterday after following all the state's recommendations for creating an account and familiarizing herself with the website. 
So what she thought was a March 27th vaccine appointment in Wakefield was actually a testing appointment. When she got a call from the health department four hours later, she asked for the soonest possible appointment and got one for March 30th in Island Pond. She wants to know if the state will work with people like her who were caught up in the website glitch to schedule her second shot closer to home. She drive almost to Canada to get it. Lisa, you said uh, she, she lives in Waitsfield and she got a um, she got a call. Uh, she she called and she got an appointment in Island Pond. She was caught up in the glitch yesterday, where she thought she was making an appointment for a vaccine, and it was actually a testing appointment. Right. Four hours later, when she was away from her computer, she got the call from someone from the health department, and they scheduled her. She asked for the soonest possible appointment because she's the caregiver for her 90-year-old mother, and she got an appointment on March 30th in Island Pond. She wants to know if you guys will help her get her second appointment closer to home. Why don't I do this? Why don't I um, get the information for you and I'll see what I can do. How's that? That's great, thank you. But don't go away because my second question is also for you. Okay. We've heard from several readers. We've heard from several readers who've been trying to book directly on the Kinney Drug and Walgreens website. Kinney Drug is consistently showing no appointments available and Walgreens is the same despite people putting in multiple zip codes into the Walgreens website and trying at multiple locations with the Kinney Drug website. Do you have any insight into that? Well, Walgreens is with the Federal Pharmacy Program. Kinney's uh, does, have, um, does have slots. Now, we, we allocate every week to Kinney's in terms of what their allocation is for the next week. So I would, I would just say keep trying or come into our website and try that in terms of our, uh, you know, our health department website and try, try that. I mean, we are, we have, you know, we're, we're going to have about 22,000 uh, doses of vaccine next week um, that we will have multiple clinics for. And the pharmacies, through the federal pharmacy program, by the way, will have about 8,000. So there should be slots opening up if you just keep checking uh, on those websites, uh, particularly the pharmacy websites. But we open slots up. Every age band that we open up, we open up enough slight slots for those age bands. So you should be able to get an appointment through those age bands. Okay, thank you very much. And um, if you want to have somebody from your office email me, I'll pass. I'll share the information about the woman going to Island Pond. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Peter Hirschfeld, VPR. Thank you, uh, Governor. Do you support the plan from U.S. Border and Customs Protection to erect surveillance towers in? Silver Vermont communities on the Vermont Canada border? Um, well, again, uh, you know, I don't know all the details, but from what I've read, um, I don't know if they have to have the range that they're, um, they're asking for. And I do think that there's uh, uh, the ability to, uh, to do something a little bit different that conforms to uh, the area uh, residents uh, and satisfies uh, their need for privacy. So. Um, I'm hopeful, um, and, and this is more of a, um, an issue with the federal de delegation and the locals, um, but um, from my standpoint, it seems as though they could come arrive at some solution uh, that would uh, satisfy both uh, the needs of uh, Vermonters as well as uh, the needs of Border Patrol to protect uh, that, that crossing or that area uh, that, uh, that could be crossed. Thank you. Uh, and Secretary Smith, um, just a clarifying question. Are all veterans able to get their vaccines through the VA at this point, or only veterans who already get their health care through the VA? You're asking me a question about a federal agency that I will attempt to answer with the caveat that I don't know all the answers to this particular question, but I think it is um, for all veterans uh, through through the VA. You don't have to be uh, getting your health care through the VA. Thank you. All right, Tom Compass 
Vermont. Uh, thank you. Uh, first question is, um, I noticed that uh, we've heard from readers that quite a, quite a bit of response when the uh, Vermont system went down yesterday, CVS got a flood of applications for people trying to get registering for scheduling through CVS instead. Uh, and one of the things that I've been trying to follow up on and understand is, does the state not receive the data when people uh, get their vaccinations through one of the participating federal pharmacy programs that is not integrated into your portal? Um, that has been a bit of a challenge uh, for us, admittedly. And that's why, you know, if, as I've said in these press conferences previously, um, while I, I understand why the federal government is trying to uh, utilize uh, the pharmacies and and uh, and has their own contracts with them, they aren't always fully integrated with us. Uh, we don't know when, for instance, uh, at one point in time, we found out that they had a surplus of uh, uh, vaccines. Uh, like there was one, one entity that had 7,000 doses unbeknownst to us. Uh, that we desperately need so we were able to claw those back uh, to put them into to put them into use um, but that's one of the you know the fallacies of this federal intervention uh, that we need to have some oversight i would much rather have the vaccines come to us and let us distribute to the uh, to the pharmacies and uh, but the, i do believe uh, that they integrate with us so that we know eventually uh, who has had the vaccine so that we can enter them into the system. But I'll let Secretary Smith answer that. Yeah, Tom, you've hit on a challenge for us, and it's been a real challenge. Now, Kinney's uh, does a flat file to us uh, once a week, so we have that, and we're integrated into their system. Walmart and um, Costco are actually integrated into our system, so we, we do have uh, look-see into there. But... Walgreens, for example, isn't, and we we have challenges uh, trying to figure out what is what is going on, and it you know it's very manual in terms of trying to figure out, trying to have a look see into that federal uh, into that federal program, and as the feds start ramping up the federal program, it, it's going to be more of a challenge. That's why what the governor said and what other governors are saying is the more that we can integrate this, the more we aren't stumbling over each other. Uh, as we move forward and you know we have a very successful program here in the state of Vermont we have a very successful registration program and and the pharmacies try, being integrated into that only enhances that program as we move forward but um, it's been a challenge uh, to have a look-see into those that are integrated with us so uh, just a quick follow-up on that um, so it may be at certain points in time as you, from now and previously and continuing that you are understating total number of Vermonters who have been vaccinated either with a single or both doses because you haven't received that data from them. Well, there'll be a lag. That's what our problem is. There's a lag in that data. Uh, eventually it gets reported. It has to get reported to the CDC and, it, and we have a... Um, a integrated sort of system with the CDC on monitoring that. But what our problem is, is been the lag that has been happening. I right. see, thank you. Uh, one last question, this I believe is for Secretary French. Uh, we've been following an issue concerning Harwood, the Union High School boys hockey team. The head coach of the team was fired in February for sending a text to his players that included several swear words. The community felt the punishment was too harsh, and they gathered about 1,400 signatures to ask the administration to reconsider. Then the assistant coach took over, and three days before the championship game, the assistant coach was arrested for his second DUI charge and will be appearing in court in April. But the uh, Harwood administration still let that coach coach the championship game. Well, what's the Department of Education's position on this, and when do you consider getting involved in what may be uh, – needing to help an administration's decisions. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm not familiar with the specific specifics of the circumstance, but I will say that school districts are required to uh, perform background checks on all their employees, and then that information is utilized to uh, 
inform their hiring decisions. Uh, but that's certainly something we can, in the specific circumstance, look into uh, to how that process functioned. But um, I'm not aware, you know, specifically of, of the decision making around this this uh, issue. So, given that he had had a previous charge of DUI, that sort of been something they took into account in the process. Yeah, I can I can tell you, being on the receiving end of that information uh, as a superintendent, you still have to make a judgment call. There's certainly certain things that might appear in someone's background check that are uh, immediate disqualifiers for employment. Uh, but there are certainly there's opportunity for uh, discretion in terms of decision making and having that personal conversation with the uh, prospective candidate to understand their motivations and the circumstances under which uh, the the information appeared in their background is important in the hiring decision. Is this something that we could follow up with you in the next press conference? Uh, sure, or just directly offline. Uh, we could have our our staff review it. Okay. Thanks very much. Welcome. Kat, WCAX. Hi. Vermont's vaccine eligibility guidelines allow everyone 16 and over to sign up by April 19th. Our neighboring states have a faster sign-up plan, including New Hampshire, which opens its full eligibility 17 days before Vermont. We've had several people ask us, you know, why is Vermont moving more slowly? So would you just mind explaining to people why this is so they understand how the comparisons of timeframes work between Vermont and other states? Yeah, you know, every state uses a different strategy. And just because they're opening up uh, the eligibility uh, doesn't mean you're going to get vaccinated any quicker uh, because everyone's getting the same supply as they did last week, the week before. I mean, it just is on a weekly basis. Um, you either get more or the same or maybe even a little less. So um, from our standpoint, uh, we know our strategy is working well. Uh, we want to make sure we maintain um, the, the approach that we're taking, we're, we're not seeing uh, that there are any slots available. And if there are slots available and, and there's more supply than need, we just open up another age band. So again, we're, we're not going to, they're not going to get there any quicker than we are in the end because it's all per capita. Um, but, but I will say that our system, I believe, is more efficient because uh, we can react to different supply uh, changes one week to the next. So, for instance, uh, when we open up the, the next age band, we'll know for sure uh, what we're going to be receiving for uh, vaccines for the next three weeks. Um, and if you open it up, if we open up tomorrow, and that's easy. I mean, that would be an easy thing to do. We could open up tomorrow, 16 and over, and, uh, and you may not get an appointment until into June. Uh, but uh, but it, I don't know if that makes you feel better or not, uh, but it doesn't get you there any quicker. And what if the supply changes one way or the other? So next week, uh, for instance, they come back and say, we've had a glitch. Uh, we're going to get uh, 10,000 fewer doses to you next week. Well, we could uh, we can fix that uh, by uh, by um, making sure that we mitigate uh, the, the number of appointments we're taking in the next age band or at that point in time. For those who have opened it up to the vast, uh, the, the vast majority, um, they're going to have to do a lot of backtracking, a lot of calling and changing of appointments and so forth. On the other hand, if all of a sudden we were to receive more uh, of a uh, uh, vaccine and we ramped up, then we could add appointments and, and uh, get through it quicker. So we just think our approach is is easily to easy to understand. We've laid it out. Uh, gives us a little bit of flexibility uh, to either ramp up or scale back, depending on the supply. But it all depends on the supply. Everything depends on the supply of the vaccine from the federal government. And then my next question is a quick data one. What do you think is the reason for the slightly lower percentage of seniors 75 and older who are vaccinated compared with the next age group of 70 to 74 on that um, vaccination progress slide that you showed earlier? Because you kind of think maybe the 75 plus groups, since they've been eligible the longest, would be the highest, or is it just a difference in the size of those groups? I, I don't know. Um, yeah, it's my, so close. It's, yeah. It's, yeah, yeah, it's hard to, hard to measure. I think they're both... Uh, outstanding and uh, as we uh, were able to show uh, we're leading the nation 65 and older so we're doing something right so I don't know what the reasoning is behind that maybe there's some hesitancy 
on the parts of some in some age group, or, or maybe uh, they, that age group has received their vaccine from the DOD, uh, Department of Defense, for instance, and we don't know about it yet because there is, there is that component uh, that, uh, again, a federal issue. Um, but we don't, uh, at this point in time, unless Secretary Smith... Uh, no, the only other could be a smaller age group. And, uh, you know, it's so small, the difference. Yeah. But, but we don't know uh, what the uh, Department of Defense, for instance, um, has who they vaccinated. They only have told us that it's about 6,000 Vermonters, but we don't know specifically what age group and so forth. So uh, I... I don't think we have the answers you're looking for, but the difference between obviously 87.33% and 86.06% uh, is in, in these smaller numbers um, could just be, um, you know, an accounting uh, type of uh, issue. Thanks, it was a curiosity. Yeah, a question for Dr. Levine about variants. Um, should it be assumed that this spike in cases is largely attributed to variants in Vermont? And given uh, that variants like the UK variant are more contagious, is it enough to follow the same precautions we've been following? Or are there certain activities that might have been safe when variants weren't as present that would now be considered high risk because we're dealing um, with an increased presence of the highly contagious variants? Yeah, thanks for bringing the discussion to variants. The, the reality is, as I said probably at the opening of the press conference, it's really a multi-component thing, and we know that there are more variants. We just don't know its prevalence right now because we don't have enough measurements in enough parts of the state to understand that. But the pattern of spread in some of the uh, situations that we've looked at make us think that variants may be catalyzing that kind of spread. And if that's true, when we do send targeted whole genome sequencing uh, requests for the uh, cases in those uh, situations, we expect we'll find at least one variant present. We know that some states um, have already recorded up to 40% of the UK variant being part of their uh, population. And the CDC originally said through the month of March it's going to become the dominant strain. Now they're extending that a little bit over time, but still the expectation is it's going to be the dominant strain for quite a period of time. So it's only when that day arrives, if you will. Um, that was the first part of your question. The other part is what can we do? Um, and I've really been trying to, to really preach the party line that um, it's really hard to do more than you're doing if you're doing all the things we've been telling you to do all along. And with the only exception to that being perhaps um, doing more double masking, making sure that your mask has no gaps on the sides so that you're getting maximal protection and protecting others maximally by wearing the mask. Um, I would hope that people could avoid any of the larger kinds of gatherings till we truly are in the kind of weather where that's um, going to happen just naturally anyways, because if it gets colder again this weekend and people gather more indoors together, uh, it is a more transmissible strain. So uh, it will, by definition, uh, be a little easier to transmit it in a crowded indoor setting. So avoiding that would still be uh, really, really important. But otherwise, no one's discovered uh, a sort of a magic cure for the fact that variants are around. And we should accept the variant as just another aspect of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. It's the same virus. It does the same things. It just does it a little better than the previous one. Um, but nothing else about it has really changed. And thank goodness we've got really good evidence now that the vaccines that are in current use are effective against it. So um, the goal would be, again, win that race and getting more and more people vaccinated. Uh, so if this becomes a dominant strain, it still won't become a high concern in terms of breaking through the vaccine. 
Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. Um, my question was the same as the one that Lisa Loomis asked earlier, and uh, which Secretary Smith replied to regarding. I've heard I've heard from people, uh, a number of people who have to travel all the way to Island Pond for their first um, for their first vaccination, and so uh, I'll await I'll await uh, Secretary Smith's response to that with regard to. Um, they're being able to get a second vaccination close to the home. Tom, if you could also connect with Secretary Smith, uh, we'll see. We'd like to know um, the details of that so that we can fix the problem. So if you could connect with him okay, offline, absolutely. that would be great. I'll just connect with him via email. Um, I'll let Secretary Smith. Yeah, Tom, I'll reach out to you. But it, I think what's happening here is people who are going trying to get the first available um, uh, appointment and the first available appointment may be in Island Pond. If they just waited a week or so, they probably would find a uh, a location around the area. But let me uh, let me reach out to you and I'll uh, I'll talk to you um, or somebody in my office will talk to you, Tom. Very good. Thanks very much. Hey, Tom. I did follow up on the glitch that you talked about. Uh, last week, and there has been a fix put in to place on that on that glitch. On the birthday glitch. Thanks so much. Yep. Thank you. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Thank you, uh, Rebecca. Uh, Governor, before I ask a question, uh, I did want to acknowledge a member of your team that's moving on. I believe today is the final day for Ted Brady, the deputy. Secretary of Commerce and Community Development, and I just wanted to say that over the past 13 months, uh, Ted has been excellent fielding questions, along with his boss, Secretary Curley, both at the news conferences and more so offline, and it's just, we appreciated his prompt and transparent responses. We're going to miss uh, Ted uh, tremendously. He's been a great teammate uh, for the last uh, over four years now uh, as a uh, uh, Deputy Secretary of the Agency of Commerce Community Development, uh, very knowledgeable and, uh, again, a, a great team player. Uh, he's not going too far, uh, but um, but at the same time, we're going to miss him. Okay, thank you. Now the hardball question. Uh, Governor, I was wondering your thoughts about the decision by the Vermont Principals Association to award high school titles to three or four teams without them stepping on a rink or court to win championship games. We have heard several complaints about the Burlington Colchester girls co-op hockey team not getting a chance to play due to close contact. Uh, and there was a question about delaying the game maybe. Last night we learned the Rice girls basketball team was told by the health department could not play this Sunday in the title game because in the semifinal there was apparently brief close contact with a Burlington high player that had tested positive. And we were told the review of the semifinal video showed VHS player may only have had like four minutes of contact in a large gym with few people. I thought the controlling time was supposed to be like 15 minutes of contact or whatever. But anyway, um, we were also told the state was not interested in investigating, apparently, because they hadn't investigated other positive cases and everything. And we now learned Danville girls also have to bow out Sunday. So, Governor... I guess in light of the opening positive comments at the start of your news conference about helping youth at opening doors, providing access to recreation, enriching hobbies, working with youth in general, seems to be just the opposite of what is happening to many Vermont high school teams. The CBU girls basketball also had to pull out Woodstock and South Burlington boys, so it's, it, it's all across the state. So should the state be bending over backwards to help these student athletes achieve their goal of playing in a title game. And this is not like team bowing out because they got caught drinking or breaking training rules. This is somewhat beyond their control of the student athletes. I think everybody understands it's an arbitrary rule and uh, just we've never done it this way. Should the state have a can do attitude, I guess? 
Well, I think we did have a can-do attitude right from the beginning. We were trying to find a path forward so that we could have uh, sports played. Um, we heard, uh, and we we heard from uh, the health experts, uh, the pediatricians, and so forth about the mental health a aspects, and and we wanted to make that happen. Uh, we've taken a lot of criticism, um, to be honest with you. We still do today from many who feel we shouldn't have played at all, uh, that we should not have even had anyone step on the ice or step on the court and play any games. So uh, for every person saying that uh, uh, crying foul in some respects because of the championship games, uh, I'm sure I can find someone who would say um, you shouldn't have ever had a single game played. Um, so we tried to find the balance, and uh, in doing so, uh, everyone has to um, had to agree uh, to different aspects on on what would happen if, and uh, and it and it's it's uh, I'm terribly disappointing uh, for those involved. I, I can't imagine uh, how they feel at this point in time, uh, but I would ask them to reflect on that they play they they got to play. They got to play the season, which, you know, four or five months ago um, wasn't going to happen. And uh, we had that, again, can-do attitude uh, and uh, pushing forward uh, so that they had the ability to at least uh, play the season under certain conditions. So I don't know the specifics, uh, Mike, about uh, whether, you know, who said what to who and and determine whether they could play the championship games. I really don't uh, know, um, but um, and and I acknowledge how disappointing that must be for the players, the kids. Uh, and I would I would also offer that uh, that again the highest priority is keeping everyone safe. Um, and uh, we are still in the midst of a pandemic, and sometimes life is just unfair. But. We have to live by the rules and uh, and make sure that we're doing all we can to protect everyone. So again, we may have missed the mark. I don't know, um, but at the same time, I I'm just uh, thrilled that they got to play at least some games during the season. We we were told that the health department was not interested in watching uh, the video to even confirm what uh, was said as to the very limited contact supposedly that the player may have had and you know i understand that, that there were rules put in place but you know you have a game plan much like when you're on the racetrack i assume you have a game plan and sometimes you have to adjust that on the fly so uh yeah, i'm just wondering uh, over the just years i i haven't liked the uh ruling of the officials but uh it's uh, something i have to live with uh, because you know that's that's what I accepted when I decided to to get on the racetrack. Regardless, I mean, I I can count a number of times that I didn't think uh, things were fair and going my way, uh, but that's just the way it is in life, and uh, that's what I accepted when I decided to get on the racetrack. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I'm going to ask Dr. Time. Levine to comment on the Department of Health. Yeah, I, I want, I'm going to make a few comments. I want to echo the governor's comment regarding the fact <clears throat> that it has to be devastating to a team to not be able to play. Um, I don't know if that devastation is greater than not having a season at all. Um, and the fact that most of these teams had a pretty good season and were able to engage in competition um, was, I think, really uh, a very, very positive feature. Um, we've often been asked about um, why we let that happen because now there are cases. Um, whereas originally there was no one who didn't want it to happen, it seemed, um, and everyone thought that it was a no-brainer to just let the season begin. But we had to go through a great deal of deliberation regarding that. And just like we now have people feeling very disappointed I don't know what we would have had if we had no competition at all during the course of the season in terms of the impact on our adolescents' mental health. With regard to the specific situations, I'm not gonna go into exquisite details about any or all of them. It's not the health department's role to actually cancel a game. 
The health department's role is to um, use contact tracing and interviewing and appraisal of the situation and what I like to call, as a clinician, clinical judgment uh, in each and every case and evaluate it com comprehensively and fully and recommend either that quarantine should occur or quarantine shouldn't occur. Uh, it's the VPA's role to deal with uh, the scheduling of games, the canceling of games, and if there are opportunities to have games rescheduled at other times. Uh, that's not certainly part of the health department's purview. Um, with the specific instances that we've been involved with, uh, not only have we had our contact tracing staff involved, we've had our Cracker Jack contact tracing staff involved uh, because these are very challenging decisions to make and we know we can't please all the people all the time. And there was a clear consensus about all of these cases where unfortunately the timing of them is poor with regard to championships but the actual clinical judgment was quite clear. And just one other additional point, it is a little different if you're in an auditorium like we're in, six feet away, everyone's wearing their masks, and it's a quite spacious room uh, that people can be quite a far apart from themselves, and they're just sitting and watching, as opposed to uh, young women or young men running up and down a basketball court breathing very heavily, yelling to one another, um, and constantly crossing paths, if you will. Uh, that's a very different kind of a circumstance, and all of those things have to go into the judgment call that's made in the end. So I just wanted to give a little better appreciation for all of that. No, I, I appreciate that, but I, I guess I was told that uh, you were not interested in watching the video to see if uh, the girl in fact, what her movements were and that there was limited. Is that true or did, did was, were you I offered was, a chance? Yeah, I, was not, I was not personally interested in watching the video, but I knew of others who had and I was comfortable with their appraisal. Okay, so you were offered a chance to I was personally offered the chance, yes, and I chose not to take that chance. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, just a note, it's, it's five minutes of one and we still have seven folks left in the queue. Greg, the County Courier. Thank you, Rebecca. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, watching the vaccine, vaccination rates over the past few weeks, uh, I noticed that Grand Isle was the first county to meet 100% vaccination rate in any of the age bands. Uh, at that point in time, I, I believe it was 100% for uh, the 75 plus. A few days later, it rose to 102% for 75 plus, which not quite sure how that math works out. And then uh, now it's down to 95% for that same age group. So uh, this may be a question for Dr. Levine. I'm, I'm wondering how the general public should uh, should trust these numbers if they're if they're up and down and you know, becoming more than 100%, and, you know, two weeks later, we're, we're losing 7%. Well, I don't know. You know, it doesn't make much sense to me, uh, the 102%, uh, but I would say uh, th that the numbers will fluctuate as time goes on, but I'm not sure why they go uh, down, uh, to be honest with you. Um, Secretary Smith. Greg, I'm not familiar with that situation. Let me do this. Let me uh, look at the numbers. There's going to be an explanation for it. I just want to know what the explanation is uh, before we all speculate here uh, w without any knowledge of what it is right now. Okay. Um, I think uh, given the time, I will uh, yield any additional time to the next person. Thank you. Over the past two months, there have been more positive cases reported on Thursdays than any other day of the week. Is there a specific reason for that, or why do you think that is? Um, I don't know, but I would suspect that it had something to do with the schedule at the universities, possibly, um, that they may, I think they're scheduled twice a week, so there may be something to that. And when the road um, 
does the testing and sends the results back. But I'll ask Commissioner Levine. Yeah, Avery, you probably also noted that uh, Mondays and Tuesdays are usually more optimism prone days. Um, and, and in this week, they were much lower. So some of it has to do with the colleges themselves and the day they test on and the day they get the results back. Others, though, have to do with, I think, human nature, which is that probably on Saturdays and Sundays, people aren't running over to do testing as their prime weekend activity, um, and it's not their priority. So they're doing it during the course of the week. Um, that's the best I can come up with for how that works. You know, Wednesdays, generally Wednesdays, Thursdays, Fridays are when we do find our higher numbers, sometimes on Saturday as well. So that would make that uh, theory hold some water, I think. Thank you. Andrew, Caledonian record? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, uh, if I may, there have been several mentions of Island Pond today. I'd like to uh, just point out that it's a beautiful drive through the heart of the kingdom to get there. Uh, but I guess I would hope that all of Essex County's vaccines don't get scooped up by people coming from other parts of the state. Um, uh, on to my question, though, uh, we're hearing from uh, school officials across the kingdom that say they are seeing COVID cases now at numbers that match or even exceed the, uh, the numbers in November and December. I know um, Secretary French and Dr. Levine have discussed a bit some of the sourcing of how cases get into schools. So what I'm wondering is how concerned are you that uh, a potential rising number of cases, especially among younger people, might upend your hopes to get schools more fully opened up? Um, yeah, I, again, I think that uh, we have to consider uh, the different areas and how the, how the virus gets into the schools um, from families and, and others. And, and I would advocate to the, to the parents and, and those in those areas so that their actions have a direct impact on the schools. Uh, it's, if it's community spread, uh, then there's active activity of the virus within the community, meaning um, there may be some things that, uh, that the community is doing or not doing uh, that is affecting uh, that virus rate, which has an effect on the school eventually. Um, so um, keep that in mind, and, and that's just another reason uh, for those uh, in those areas to make sure they get their vaccination when they can and sign up for that because you're going to be protecting your your school uh, or, or your school's ability uh, to open up to full-time uh, operation, which we know kids desperately need. So uh, I don't know, may, uh, Commissioner Levine might be able to add more to the context of that. Yeah, I want to give Secretary French a chance as well, but uh, in my, my instance, um, some data that I'm aware of is that uh, one of the prime ways that a student at school becomes a positive case is when you do the tracing through contact in their own household. Uh, that is the predominant way, actually. And of course, the contact in their own household is, again, as the governor was been saying part of what's going on in the community um, as opposed to a classmate um, that's been the predominant pathway um, so obviously we are very very uh, interested in following this data very closely as we talk about the recovery process uh, in schools secretary french yeah, I would uh, just emphasize uh, the point around that's the function of our guidance. Um, I think we've always been very careful uh, not only to assess, you know, the latest research and so forth, but also to uh, really make sure our guidance is, is responsive to the on-the-ground conditions in Vermont. And, you know, that's exactly kind of what we're doing now with evaluating the, not only the CDC guidance, but the studies that informed it. Uh, but we do have to intersect that with an understanding of what our conditions are. I think, you know, one of the reasons we've been successful in that regard is that we have a very good understanding of what our conditions are, not to belabor the point, but we've, as a state, deployed a lot of uh, testing, for example. So 
we have a very good understanding, and of course, we have uh, really strong and regular contact with our schools related to contact tracing and so forth. Uh, but we do uh, have to seek that balancing act. It's not as, as simple as looking at uh, the CDC guidance and adopting it. We've always been very careful uh, to ensure it can be applied in our setting. Um, you know, again, I think the broader trend is still uh, one of conditions improving, particularly as the uh, vaccine uh, makes a bigger impact in our case accounts and with the warmer weather and so forth. We're optimistic that the trends will be heading in the right direction, uh, which allow us to uh, make modifications to the guidance in areas like distancing, which in turn uh, will allow districts to adopt more in-person instruction. So it is uh, it's cause for concern, certainly, but it's, it's always been a cause for concern. It's something that's uh, factored regularly into our decision-making process. And just to put an exclamation okay. point on those comments, um, people should not un should understand that the CDC guidance is not do A, B, and C to reopen your schools. It is do A, B, and C, or maybe only A, or maybe only B and C, depending on what your rate of new cases is in the surrounding community and what is your percent positivity rate. So it really does force you to look at conditions on the ground, if you will, as you make your decisions in any particular district or in a particular state. Okay, thank you. Joe, the Barton Chronicle. Uh, thank you. Um, this, I think, picks up from the last question. Um, we've had some concern uh, in our area and some schools that at some point the state might mandate um, the reopening of schools to in-person education. And is that something that is at all in sight, say, for this school year or even for the fall? I would say, uh, from my standpoint, uh, we have not contemplated making this mandatory, at least in this school year. Um, we want to make sure it's safe. We want to provide uh, to, to try and um, eliminate some of the obstacles uh, along the way. Um, some of that was in making sure that the education system was uh, vaccinated. Uh, we're doing that as we speak, and a number of them have already had their, uh, their vaccines at this point. Um, and uh, I know the, the distancing was uh, an issue, and now the CDC has come out with reducing from six feet to three feet, and I know that Secretary French and team are contemplating that as we speak. So um, we're not uh, contemplating, at least the, at this point in time, mandating going back uh, to school for in-person instruction. Secretary French? I would just emphasize the point that, um, you know, we've had to uh, deploy a certain amount of flexibility into our planning all along uh, because of the variation in operating conditions among our schools and districts. So it would be one thing to mandate it, but it'd be another thing altogether to successfully operationalize that mandate. Uh, so we have to be, uh, you know, we have to consider the operational realities of our school districts in terms of staff availability and so forth. Uh, so, as you know, the government, governor mentioned um, the approach of sort of eliminating the barriers uh, to get to that goal has been our preferred strategy and one I think will work best uh, with that understanding of our operational conditions in the state. Thank you. Um, I had one question that seems to be one of those things that has to be asked every month or two, and that is... Um, what is the standing of research on um, the ability of people who have been fully vaccinated to um, transmit the virus despite not having yet any symptoms of their own? <clears throat> you know, you, that's probably one of those questions that does deserve a monthly examination uh, because the data is starting to accumulate but it's by no means 100% definitive yet. But we are seeing more data that indicate that vaccination does reduce the positivity rate of nasal swabs being tested for the virus. 
in those who have gotten the vaccine versus those who have uh, gotten the placebo. Um, the only trial of vaccine I'm aware of that actually intentionally did that as part of the trial was the AstraZeneca trial, and they reported a two-thirds uh, of those who uh, were vaccinated did not have positive PCRs uh, compared to the placebo group, um, which is pretty nice to see. The other trials, I think some of them are doing it sort of after the fact, and there's more scientific research being done on it all the time. So. Um, we're hopeful and optimistic that this respiratory virus, like most respiratory viruses that have a vaccine made against them, uh, won't be able to survive in people's nose, and uh, we won't show much in the way of infectivity. So it's still a work in progress, so you'll have to come back in another month. Uh, when I think we'll still be doing these, and uh, you'll uh, get another answer, hopefully. It will have advanced slightly. Thank you very much. You can count on me asking again if you're still doing these things. Michael BT Digger. Hi, I wanted to ask about the uh, reporting that came out in seven days this week about a soldier in the Vermont National Guard uh, who's been charged with assault. Uh, and I wanted to ask Governor for you to expand on the statement that you put out yesterday. Um, according to seven days, the uh, this soldier has uh, been found guilty of crimes that uh, guard officials admit should have led to his discharge. Uh, last night, I know General Knight uh, said that it could take up to six months to a year uh, to kind of work through the process. I want to know, uh, do, do you believe this so soldier should be discharged? Yeah, well, again, I'm from, I have a lot of faith in General Knight and, his, uh, and I appreciate uh, how he's handled this situation uh, that's uh, unfolding as we speak. So I, um, I'm fully supportive of everything he's done and will uh, you know, follow his guidance on this. Uh, he knows more of the particulars than I do, uh, and, uh, but I haven't spoken to him directly about this uh, at this point either. There's one aspect of this story that seems to have stuck out to readers, which is the, uh, that Guard soldiers are uh, effectively asked to self-report um, if they have some kind of uh, criminal history. Uh, and likewise, it, it sounds like uh, what General Knight put out yesterday uh, was saying that uh, the, a better system might be for uh, police to ask whenever they're arresting someone if that person is a member of the Vermont National Guard. And it, it seems uh, that people are responding to the fact that, uh, that it seems like there ought to be a better way uh, to conduct some kind of background check or to uh, understand when members of the Guard uh, have issues that, that ought to be addressed uh, such as these. And, you know, knowing that uh, there should be a roster of the, the people in the Guard and that, you know, there are records of, of when people are arrested and charged with crimes, how is there not a, a better system for kind of bridging that gap? Yeah, it's just one of those issues that's been overlooked, uh, to be perfectly blunt. And I, I do believe I agree with the readers and others and General Knight that the system should change. And uh, we, um, I believe uh, that we will seek change and that we will have a better system as a result of this situation. Do you have an idea of what that system might look like? Uh, no, I mean, I'm going to leave it to the General Knight uh, and others and uh, it may take a legislative change. I, I don't know at this point, but, uh, um, but suffice it to say that uh, we, we believe uh, there needs to be a change as well. Thank you. Alex, Burlington Free Press. Hi, can you hear me? We can. Uh, uh, my questions are for Dr. Levine. I'd, I'd like to circle back to the topic of high school sports. Mike Donnie, you raised uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, Dr. Levine, what was your or the state's recommendation to Rice in regards to its girls' basketball team and playing in the championship game? We made, we made no recommendation regarding playing in the championship game. We made a recommendation regarding quarantine based on the contact with a positive case. 
Okay, and um, I know you touched upon this already, but how does the state define a close contact for sports and competition? Is it no longer a cumulative total of 15 minutes within six feet? No, that's certainly part of the equation. In fact, Vermont created that rule for the uh, CDC, if you will. Uh, so that's part of the equation. And it's also other aspects of the interviews and other aspects of what I'm calling clinical judgment regarding uh, the proximity of people and the intensity of effort, meaning um, not just s staring at people or having a conversation, but actually involved in vigorous athletic activities. So that would go beyond um, 15 minutes. It's not just that's the, that's not the only piece. It's a, right. It's a it's a it's a it's a definite decision that's multi multi component. Absolutely. And it involves judgment and it involves experience over the course of a one-year pandemic, um, knowing uh, how we've called things and uh, knowing when and how we've called them right. Okay, thank you for your time. Page. Right. Page, one last chance, star six to unmute. That's it. All right, thank you very much for tuning in. We'll see you again on Tuesday. Uh, stay safe this weekend. And uh, a reminder, uh, those 50 and over on Monday can sign up. So. Uh, Make sure you do so. Thanks very much.